uh, one of our own, uh, Max Tweedy. Uh, Max joined uh, Beef and Lamb Genetics at the uh, end of last year and has come on board with a lot of enthusiasm. Um, Max has um, got a background in agriculture with a degree at uh, Lincoln and um, got um, Australia, Australianised at Armidale before he came on board. Um, and Max is uh, from um, Northern Hawke's Bay and uh, has a background in sheep and beef breeding and is heavily involved previously and I think currently a wee bit with Angus. So anyway, Max is going to talk to us about the value of carcass data. Cheers. I, I promise I'm not biased. Uh, rightio, um, I'm just going to keep this nice and quick. Uh, afterwards, um, he's an Angus AGM, so we'll just rip through it. Rightio, um, we're going to start off with a question that is how do we estimate or how do we evaluate animals for genetic merit? And, um, and, and that comes down to a few things we need before we, before we jump into this carcass data question. And, and that begins with, uh, with fixed and random effects. We need to know a few things before we can estimate how much is genetic merit and how much is passed on to the next generation. The first thing is sex. Sex in relation to uh, females, have a, uh, they, they grow slower to, to males and there's a, there's a sex difference. Age, we know age affects the way an animal performs. A calf born in the first cycle is at an advantage to a calf born in the third cycle and so on. And we know we have effects like herd, uh, and, and contemporary management um, and the way those like with like can be compared. So there's all these different factors that need to be accounted for if we're going to estimate the uh, amount of, of merit that is genetic. And of course the other side which is known as genetic effects and that's things like heritability, so how much of the variation we see in a trait is genetic, taking into account all known or possible information, so parents, siblings, to make a more informed decision. And of course, correlated traits. Um, so we know that we can estimate growth from birth weight and, and, and likewise for other things. But the point is, is, if we're going to estimate how much is genetic merit, then we need to simultaneously estimate these. We need to bring them in together, and we use a system called breed plan and, and, and beef. And, and with that, we produce unbiased estimates of the genetic merit of an animal as a parent compared to other animals. The important part is as a parent. Rightio, now we come back to the original question and it starts basic. It's can we assess the average animal in the works for carcass quality? Can we do that? There's a few nods, yeah we can do that. Yeah that's a good start. And the second one is can we use those animals in the works, everyday carcasses, can we assess those for genetic merit. Is there nods or is there shakes or? When we look at those animals, do we have fixed and random effects? Can we account for those things? And can we account for genetic effects? Something we maybe can. But the point, the point is, is that without these basic things like parentage, accounting for all known information, age, accounting for how old that animal is and, and how it affected its performance or its phenotype, and of course, the last one being contemporary grouping, comparing like with like. And so unless we have that information, we can't assess your average carcass in the works. So have a think about rem and remember that. Okie doke. Now how can we get this data? If we wanted to get that information, that information in the works, how can we get it? What animals could we use? And would they be, would they be valuable? The first one is a cull stud bulls and heifers. I guess we could, um, you know, we, we, we could kill a selection of, of cull stud bulls and there'd, there'd be a few that would represent a, a range of size, I guess, and we could, we could collect some from, from cull heifers as well. But at the end of the day, it's a small amount, it's low effectiveness. It's not a very good um, population or data to work with, it's quite small. And then of course we have research stations, which New Zealand doesn't have, in beef. We could have a look at that, I guess. We could look at commercial performance recorded herds, so places that don't keep uh, calves and tyre, we could grab the steers out of those, that'd be great, there's not a lot of that in New Zealand, but we could use that information, or we could use a thing called a progeny test, where we could spread the cost and record a number of traits and have a look at, um, have a look at being able to collect that carcass data alongside other things, and so that's quite relevant. And you'll find that BLG's doing one of those, isn't that handy? 
Rightio, now we come back to this, to this question, how is carcass traits measured? The first one, and I know there's been a bit of a marbling thing today, and I'm not, I'm not all biased towards marbling, but neither am I the other way. The point is we can collect it, and it's, it's highly useful information. The first part is um, we can collect, collect it via chemically extracted IMF samples. And this is where we, from the ribeye, we take a sample and we extract the fat. And we see exactly as a percentage how much of that, of that sample is fat. And so that's the, that's the raw thing, that's the, the holy grail of collecting marbling. But of course we do damage that product. And, that's, and that, that's a really important thing. We also have things like lab tests where we can measure shear force or, or tenderness, how easy it is to push, a, push something through another thing for tenderness. And of course, um, the older generation had to have beef that was nice and tender and easy to cook. And of course, cooking loss, which isn't really a, a, a directly eating quality uh, measure. But um, we have that, and we have another thing here called abattoir carcass crating. And this is when the, when the carcass is hung up we check that carcass out, and we look at it for carcass quality. Now this is, this is highly useful information. And at this stage, New Zealand's never collected this type of data. It's hard to believe, but we've never gone to the works and looked at the, at the carcass hung up. We've only ever collect, collected measurements in the live animal. So what we can do, we can collect that via our systems like MSA, Meat Standards Australia, it's, it's a system where we can record multiple wedding quality traits and grade them against the card. We've got MSA, Meat Standards Australia, and, and now in, in New Zealand we've got BFEQ, the Silver Fern Farm System. You know, there's a number of ways we can measure these wedding quality traits, but not all of them create data that is submittable to Bree Plan. It's a really, really inf useful information. It also gives us a chance to measure things like retail beef fuel or dressing percentage and carcass weight which uh, otherwise are just correlated traits. You can't measure how a, an animal hung up for evaluation in terms of weight unless you actually go out there and do it. So really useful, useful data. And we've never clicked that information before. Right, yeah. And the other option is in the live animal, and this is at 400 days ultrasound scanning. We know in the stud world that's a pretty common measure, and it's a fantastic way to show genetic differences. We measure eye muscle area, we measure marbling, or intramuscular fat, rib and rump fat, and they are all fantastic measures. It's a cheap and easy way to show differences between animals. And the important thing is, is that we need live data or information collected at the abattoir to underpin that. And that's, that's a really important message to take home. So we need to collect this sort of information. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a table here that compares ultrasound scanning in effect to, um, to some of that carcass information when it's hung up. And it's a little bit controversial, but we start with this thing called Ausmeet Marble Score, which we talked about. Ausmeet and MSA, they're two ways to measure uh, marbling hung up in the, in the animal. And that's on the top line. So we've compared it and we've looked at that and it has a genetic correlation of 0 0.99. A genetic correlation of zero means the traits are, you know, they're not correlated, they're not the same thing. And then at one is, is the ultimate, they're the same trait. So on the top, we can see that Ausmeet and MSA, same thing. And we come down to here and we look at carcass intramuscular percentage, or that extracted sample, and we compare that to Ausmeet marble score. And we know that we can, com we can predict the exact marbling percentage to a point almost identically with Ausmeet marble, by using Ausmeet marble score. So if we, ha we hang an animal up, we can compare what it's like uh, to the T. And we can see that those two values have a low standard error. They're not going to fluctuate at a given accuracy a heck of a lot. And then of course we have scan marbling, the third one, and we can comparing scan marbling to Osmeet marble score. And we can see that's a little bit lower, it's the, to the 0.65, so it's, they're, they're not quite as high and it's not saying um, they're quite as well correlated as, as some of these other traits. But still, but still a useful and, and excellent measure of, of, um, of, of to show differences between animals. And of course the last one, we look at scan rib fat, scan rump fat and eye muscle area and we compare those to MSA and Ausmeet, and we can see that those are just about bang on, they're the same thing. So the only variation there is a little bit is this, um, is this marbling, and that's across breeds. The, the important thing to take away from that is scanning is very useful, less so for marbling, but really important, and we need to do that to show genetic differences. New Zealand's never collected carcass data in the avatar before, so I remember, remind you that, and that information is really important in underpinning good selection and good measurement and give you accuracy, radio. We can measure these traits in other ways, 
and um, and the first one is, is genomics, and we've heard a bit about that today from Charles, and um, allows us to predict the performance of an animal from a gene test and do it early. And I've said it before, but it allows us to, uh, with a simple test, to predict whether or not the calf in front of you is going to be a Richie McCaw or a club rugby player. And that's developing as we collect more, more animals, get a better reference group, and develop that data set. So that's fantastic information. We have things like trait correlations where we predict the performance on one trait from another. So we know that uh, animals with high retail beef yield or dressing percentage tend to be a bit leaner. So we can use one thing to predict another. And then, of course, we've got other opportunities in the future, like hyperspectral imaging. We can take a photo with the camera and, and, uh, and, and, and tell a carcass and, and belly from there. Another thing that uh, RGBD cameras, um, which is just like on your Xbox, um, although I was never allowed one, and, and, and really compares the animal across the tissue, across the animal at 400 days. So that, that's developing opportunities, but um, okie doke. Now, if we could collect this data, what would it be worth? I said it before, we've never collected it before. The important thing is that we can, we can ramp up um, selection accuracy. And what I'm really talking about here is that carcass, carcass grader data, that carcass information in the works. We can, we can ramp up selection accuracy because those EBVs become a, a fairer estimate or, or they're a high percentage. And we can reduce our confidence intervals. So confidence intervals is how much a given EBV will fluctuate at a certain accuracy. So we know that, um, that, we, that we, can, we can increase our confidence intervals and you as a, as a breeder and as a buyer can have more confidence in that EBV. And of course, we've, we never collect information like carcass weight and retail beef field, which are key drivers. So we can collect that information also. I've just got a little table here, it's about heritability. So on the bottom side is percentage or um, how much of a, of a trait is, um, how much of that variation is genetic. And then the other side we have some EBV traits here. And we can see that at 0.3 or 30%, all of those traits are highly heritable and we can make progress in, in them quickly. And in doing that, as we heard from Kerry, we can, we can target and we can meet market specifications we can add value to our bottom line. The important thing to remember here is that progress equals balance. So if we, if, if we have lab tests and we have objective IMF, we carcass grade and we get good genomics in time, we can make a lot more progress in, those, in, those, um, in that area and we can meet market specifications. Add that 25 cents per kilo. And it's, um, it's a lot better than what we're currently doing with trait correlations and trying to use one trait to measure another without directly measuring it in ultrasound scanning. So it's, and that's pretty important. And like I said, there's a variety of places we can get this, but the most important are progeny tests. The easiest and um, spread the costs, and spread the cost between breed societies. So I'm gonna put a value on, the, on it in the marketplace. And so Meat Stands Australia are, uh, are, have um, shown 25 years of research. It might be a bit high on the 25 years, but, but a heap of research historically that's shown that marbling is a, is, is a key component, and, um, but that market um, specs can be met with better genetics. So we've got value there. Now I've put here $45 per head within beef EQ. That should really be $75 per head, because um, I base mine on a 15 cent premium. It should be 25 cent premium. But uh, effectively what that means is that um, over the hectare, there's a potential for 150 bucks premium by hitting that by hitting that grade. And that's not just silver fern farms, beef EQ, there's opportunities with Angus Pure and with Hereford Prime and um, for, for meeting carcass quality and, and for um, targeting what the consumer's after. It's not about one individual trait, um, but a key trait to notice is that, um, that marbling, we, we heard it from Kerry, that a, a marble score lift of one marble score is worth a dollar per kilo it's pretty significant if you're getting four bucks, it's a 25% lift. Or in Australian markets, it's worth a 24% premium. So there's a lot of value in this. What we're looking at here on the left is in sewer fern farms beef EQ and those carcass quality grades, a series of, um, of measures they take. So a couple of these aren't eating quality based, like dressing percentage and carcass weight, but meat color, fat color, EMA, rib fat marbling, ossification, ultimate pH, effect, mar effect eating quality. And then we, we think about some of the uh, EBVs we have that we can directly influence them with. 
and on the side here. So ultimate pH, we're talking about dark cutting. And we know that quite a cattle at, at slaughter, they use less energy or um, less glycogen in the muscle and so they're able to die. Um, and that's, uh, in terms of dark cutting, um, that, that's a benefit. So quite a cattle kill easier. And then we've got a heap of different EBVs there that with better under, underpinned objective measurement will make more progress in. But plenty of EBVs and we, and we can do that easily. Rightio, and we've got one more here as a, as a case study, and this is a group called Team Tamania in Australia. And we mentioned that New Zealand's never before collected abat abattoir-graded data. These guys do it in 42 herds commercially every year and have done for 10 years. All of that information gets delivered back. Um, they, they progeny test one of, uh, a, a, several young sires every year across commercial herds and they do a, a certain level of performance recording. All of those animals are DNA'd and they're fodded through, the, through the, uh, a long fed system uh, and, and, and through the, the production and, and value chain. And they get delivered massive premiums for having consist consistency in meeting market um, specifications. And it's got, it's got large flow on effects. And all that information goes into breed plan and they're collecting more information than New Zealand beef industry's recording on carcass. Heap. Okie doke, now take home messages. If we want to estimate um, genetic merit, evaluate animals, we need age, contemporary grouping, and parentage. Remember that. Abattoir carcass data we've never collected before is extremely important and underpins good selection. We need it, and it's high value. Ultrasound scanning is awesome for showing genetic differences. We need to use that, but it's really important that we get some live data, uh, we get some abattoir data. Progeny testing is the key. And um, cattle with the right genetic package and makeup, alongside good management, will hit the market and deliver you better premiums. Right, yeah, thanks. Max, you talked about the um, ultimate pH and the relationship that docility has to that, the uh, docility EBV. Um, do you have any data on correlations between those, that EBV and the um, ultimate pH? Uh, what, well, what we do know is that ultimate pH um, is, a, is affected by docility, but how much, I can't give you that. Docility in itself is quite highly heritable. Um, and what we're doing in the beef progeny test in August, uh, before 400 days of age, is collecting uh, docility scores on all animals within the crush, um, and, and, and looking at its um, yeah at that stage, looking at the variation of the trait. But in terms of exactly how much that underpins, I can't tell you. If anyone else can answer that question, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, Wayne might be able to. So I can't give you a specific correlation between pH and docility, our attitude is more focused on docility to make cattle that are easier to handle on the farm, manage your cattle nutrition to improve your pH. Um, they are likely to be correlated, but if the heritability of pH is only 5% or less, then even if they're strongly correlated, it's still explaining a small percentage of pH. So my attitude is focus on docility for improving handling on farm, focus on management to improve your pH. So there's probably a link, but it's only going to explain a small percentage of pH. Yeah, over to him, Annie. Annie. Run the microphone over. Yeah, Max, I was just wondering if there was um, any data that that came out of the Australian benchmarking program that sort of would give us an idea of the correlation between the ultrasound EMA of these animals and the actual carcass EMA at slaughter. Is there a, um, a sort of percentage correlation that's come out of that? Yeah, so if we bring it back here, so we've got scan EMA uh, in relation to, to uh, MSA or, or Rosmeat uh, eye muscle area. And that's 0 0.9 genetic correlation. Um, the, the, the only difference is those animals um, were uh, scanned just before they were killed, and they're also scanned at 400 days of age, um, whereas the standard EBV is only estimated at 400 day of, days of age, so it's using live information in a year to predict how they'll kill 
maybe some time later. So what we're see, what we're seeing there is is just before slaughter. So. The size EMA. Oh, okay. When their progeny was slaughtered, was, was a the size EMA when their progeny was was slaughtered. What was the correlation between the size EMA and three years later when their progeny was slaughtered and the EMA was actually measured in the carcass? So, so you, you talk, you're pretty much talking about standard error on an EBV with progeny information. Yep. Is that? I guess I'm I'm interested to know if the the prediction of the EMA of these sires that were in the in the trial, how close was it to the when their when their progeny lines were slaughtered, and their EMA was measured? Uh, what was the correlation between that and the predicted EMA? Yeah. So, um, what information I can give you is that within the Australian Sire Benchmarking Program, is that uh, poorer animals got poorer, and good animals got better, and so there was some re-ranking, but as it went, animals stayed within their virtually a percentile band. So um, uh, the estimates on, on EBVs with no progeny information, progeny information is the really good stuff. That's how we make, get high accuracy and make good progress. That was, um, it was pretty much reflected later on in term, terms of where they sat within the breed. So um, in terms of EMA specifically, I don't have a, I don't have a, a dead set answer to give you on that one, but um, I can tell you from my experience that that's probably how I'd expect it to be.